Hi everyone, my name is Tanner Merlis, and I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. I'm really happy to be here today to share with you my lecture, Hollywood Movie Making Magic and Military Public Relations. All major U.S. advertisers pay Hollywood Studios to place branded commodities in its storytelling. With 288 million in promotional tie-ins, Spider-Man Far From Home set a record for seamlessly integrated branding. Watch Spider-Man battle Mysterio and enjoy Audi, Pepsi, and United Airlines. What may be less apparent to us, and to many people all over the world, is how routinely the U.S. military places itself in popular films. In many ways, the U.S. military is engaged in product placement too. The business of Hollywood movie making magic and the politics of military public relations and spin routinely converge. Books such as Operation Hollywood by David Robb, National Security Cinema by Matthew Elford and Tom Secker, and Hearts and Minds by yours truly show how for more than 100 years the U.S. military has helped Hollywood to make hundreds of war films and has even had a hand in shaping 21st century hits such as Pearl Harbor, Some of All Fears, Transformers, Act of Valor, Zero Dark Thirty, Godzilla, Battleship, Man of Steel, and G.I. Joe. Why does the U.S. military create movies with Hollywood? And what does Hollywood get in return for its military service? In this lecture, I'm going to highlight the historical and contemporary relationship between Hollywood and the U.S. military when it comes to making war movies. And I'm going to discuss some of the social and cultural consequences of this Hollywood military filmmaking relationship for the United States and the wider world. Here is some historical context. In the lead up to World War I, David Wart Griffith, a friend of President Woodrow Wilson, started working on The Birth of a Nation, a racist retelling of the Civil War that glorifies the violence of the Ku Klux Klan with assistance from the Army's West Point engineers. But it was during World War I that the relationship between the U.S. military and Hollywood was solidified as the U.S. military saw movies as helpful to its wartime imperative to recruit civilians into the ranks, build public support for the war and war bonds, and convey an image of U.S. fighting power to its opponents. George Creel's Committee on Public Information was a wartime propaganda agency that interfaced with Hollywood executives, enlisting them into its mass communications and public influence campaign. William Brady, head of the National Association of the Motion Picture Industry, Hollywood's lobby group at the time, sent a memo to the White House in which he said, quote, the motion picture can be the most wonderful system for spreading national propaganda at little or no cost." End quote. The U.S.'s World War II propaganda agency, the Office of War Information, formed the Bureau of Motion Pictures in 1942 to network with Hollywood again, regarding Hollywood as an essential war industry. As the Office of War Information head Elmer Davis explained, quote, the motion picture is the most powerful instrument of propaganda in the world, whether it tries to be or not. The easiest way to inject a propaganda idea into most people's minds is to let it go through the medium of an entertainment picture when they do not realize that they are being propagandized." End quote. With the support of Hollywood, the Bureau of Motion Pictures produced, indirectly censored, and distributed war films to theaters in the United States and in other countries. Some of these included Frank Capra's classic, Why We Fight. Irving Berlin's This Is the Army is another important film of that time. So by working with the Office of War Information, Hollywood became the preeminent transmitter of wartime policy. As Thomas Doherty puts it, when workers left the factory, they did not leave the war. Following World War II, the hitherto special wartime arrangement between the U.S. military and Hollywood was normalized. Throughout the Cold War, the national security state of exception became the new rule, as the U.S. grew to become the world's superpower, and won permanently at war to make the world safe for U.S.-centered capitalism, and sometimes liberal democracy too. In 1948, the U.S. military's public affairs branch opened the Motion Picture Production Office, and in 1944, it hired Donald Barrack, a former New York theater producer, to head it. Barrack became the DOD's liaison with Hollywood, reading, vetting, and co-producing war scripts with Hollywood for the next 40 years. 
One of the biggest military Hollywood hits in the 80s was Top Gun, which helped the U.S. Air Force recruit a new generation of air people. Nearing the end of the Cold War in 1989, Phil Strubb replaced Barrack as the head of the DOD's Special Assistant for Entertainment Media. Strubb was basically then charged with assisting Hollywood's production of hundreds of war films for the years to come. In 2018, Strubb retired from that post and was then replaced by David Evans, who had previously spent 13 years as a DOD public affairs specialist. Regardless of who is at the helm of this military entertainment liaison office, the military regularly assist Hollywood studios to make war-themed films by granting filmmakers access to military installations such as bases and barracks, personnel like officers and soldiers, software, knowledge about military protocol, chain of command, systems operation, weaponry, troop lingo, and even drill routines. But most importantly, what the military gives to Hollywood is access to hardware that would be otherwise impossible to acquire without breaking the budgets of even the biggest blockbuster films. All those battleships, jet fighters, tanks, and helicopters we see in blockbuster war films, those are complements of the U.S. military. Yet not all films about war get the military's support. In fact, the military has refused to assist films such as Platoon, Full Metal Jacket, G.I. Jane, and In the Valley of Ella. The military will only work with Hollywood when its war film scripts abide by the DOD's own content requirements, as stipulated by Instruction 5410.16, a doctrine that I've shown elsewhere to be a type of cultural policy that supports the production, promotion, and protection of military cultural products. According to this policy, the DOD will assist Hollywood's making of war films when these films serve the national interest. War film scripts that seem to positively promote the military's own view of war and warfighting realities, inform and influence public opinion about the military, interlink with recruitment campaigns, and defend current U.S. foreign policy positions tend to get U.S. military support. Films that don't abide by these content stipulations don't get support. If the U.S. military thinks a script has some potential to fulfill these policy objectives, but is not quite polished enough, its script readers will offer filmmakers some script revision suggestions and invite them to resubmit their work to the DoD for a second look and perhaps a shot at getting some support. The U.S. military does not own or control Hollywood's major studios nor does it coerce or force Hollywood creatives to make commercially viable military public relations films on its behalf. The relationship between these two different types of institutions, economic and political, is based upon consent and a system of mutually beneficial incentives that motivate a fusion of Hollywood money-making with military public opinion management, especially during wartime. Let's now take a closer look at Iron Man and Transformers two militainment films that I've published some research on over the past few years. Iron Man is a Marvel comic books inspired Hollywood film produced by Marvel Studios, which is now owned by Walt Disney Company. Based on the Cold War era Marvel comic by the same name, the film is about Tony Stark, played by Robert Downey Jr., a multi-millionaire engineer whose Stark Industries inherited from his father, researches, develops, and sells weapons technologies to the United States Department of Defense. The DoD supported this film's production by linking Marvel Studios to the U.S. Air Force, which turned its Edwards Air Force Base into a Hollywood set piece for three days of shooting. The Air Force also allowed Marvel Studios to cast over 100 off-duty air persons as extras in the film. It also flew its F-22 Raptor aircraft for the camera to help Marvel create high-altitude action combat sequences. It provisioned helicopters, Humvees, and jumbo jets. The Air Force also supported Iron Man's production by giving acting lessons to Terrence Howard, by embedding him on its base, and letting him observe, train with, and learn about the way the Force operates. Significantly, Iron Man the film interfaces with the DoD's attempt to make an actual Iron Man suit, a cyborg soldier suit, if you will. Since Iron Man's debut, DOD-sponsored university researchers and defense companies have been working to turn Iron Man fiction into real technology. At the level of ideology and persuasive communication, Iron Man definitely gives promotional support to U.S. foreign policy by affirming the U.S.'s post-9-11 war policy in Afghanistan. 
Iron Man represents Afghanistan as a space of danger and threat to America, a space that must be contained and controlled with expressions of U.S. military might. In the film's opening scene, Stark is being toured around Afghanistan by the U.S. military, but then ambushed by the Ten Rings jihadist terrorist group. Iron Man also contributes to the post-9-11 and ongoing othering of Muslims and Arabs as enemy threats to the United States and the West. For over 100 years, Hollywood has made Orientalist films that define America positively by othering Arabs and Muslims as heartless, brutal, uncivilized religious fanatics, terrorists, and so forth. And Iron Man feeds into this neo-Orientalist othering of Muslim and Arab peoples. In Iron Man, the majority of Arabs and Muslims are portrayed as villainous terrorists, contrasted with the heroic American Stark and his allies. Iron Man also conveys the doctrine of humanitarian imperialism. This is the idea that the U.S. always intervenes in or should intervene in other countries on behalf of the welfare, rights, and well-being of others suffering some kind of evil or terror or threat. Iron Man literally kills bad Afghanis to liberate good Afghani civilians. He is their savior. His violence helps them survive. Without them, they would not be free. At least that's the message of Iron Man. Basically, this is an old colonial trope. Stark, a powerful white man, saves weak but good brown people from strong but bad brown people. Quite a racist premise, but in keeping with the long-standing trope of white man's burden. Furthermore, Iron Man personifies the U.S.'s exceptional estate, which makes and breaks global rules, frequently with impunity. To secure America and the world from threat, Stark must play by his own rules and pursue goals he deems just, free of external constraints on his power, on his sovereignty. And in this regard, we can read Iron Man as a bit of an allegorical figure or symbol for the United States as a whole. Another significant military-supported blockbuster film is Transformers by Michael Bay. As Phil Strubb attests, Michael Bay has always been an advocate of the military, a real supporter who's been working on pictures with the military for a very long time. As Ian Bryce, one of Transformers producers of hers, quote, We would never have been able to make this movie without the willingness of the DOD to embrace this project. The cooperation we received was outstanding, end quote. So how concretely did the DOD assist Bay in the making of Transformers? Well, first, the DoD granted Bay access to its bases and installations and let him shoot them as backdrops for on-screen action. The DoD also assisted the production companies with on-location shots at the Pentagon and the Hoover Dam. Importantly, the DoD also let Michael Bay use significant pieces of military hardware. The F-22 Raptor, for example, cost about $150 million per unit, and it was cast in this film as Starscream. The MQ-1 Predator unmanned aerial vehicle or drone costs about $4.3 million per unit and the military flew this drone around for Michael Bay's camera. In the end, Transformers makes military personnel look great and conveys a support the brass and a support the troops message. Transformers also portrays the DoD as a globally networked super sovereign and nearly omniscient entity that sees the world as a battlefield and wages war whenever it likes, wherever it wants, with whatever means available. So the film portrays threats to American and global security, fictional alien robots as the basis for the legitimization of America's military global reach and incredible influence. To secure the world from threats, teenagers in America team up with the DoD and American-branded robot automobiles to wage war against the evil Decepticons across borders, while unleashing spectacular violence along the way. The Decepticons are neutralized, restoring security to the United States and the globe. So these films depict the United States as an exceptional military, but one that is needed and a force for global good. Scott Lusk, a Lockheed Martin PR person, says putting his company's weapons in Transformers helped, quote, promote state-of-the-art high-tech products that are designed, developed, and manufactured for the U.S. military, end quote. Films like Transformers may help to win or sustain public consent for increased state expenditures on new weapon systems, as opposed to public spending for non-lethal public goods and services, such as education, health care, welfare, and even public transit. This film shows off the power of the DoD's incredible arsenal and frames DoD weapons as essential to American and global security. Also, by projecting the DoD's technological superiority, 
Films like Transformers may deter the would-be enemies and opponents of the United States from imagining they could actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S. and win a war. By showing the DoD using its arsenal to destroy and obliterate powerful intergalactic robot enemies, these films might even act as popular forms of deterrence to really existing or potential U.S. adversaries. Iron Man and Transformers are just two of the hundreds of military-supported movies on offer these days. For historical and up-to-date data on the films the U.S. military has helped to make, I recommend you take a look at Tom Secker's website, spyculture.com, which uses Freedom of Information Act request results to demonstrate these relationships between the military and Hollywood. So what's at stake in all of this? Well, propaganda is the deliberate, systematic attempt to shape public perceptions and direct behavior to achieve a response that furthers the desired intent of the propagandist. When we study DOD Hollywood relationships and the films that they create, we can see how the Department of Defense deliberately and systematically attempts to shape film entertainment products into tools of shaping the public perception of its organizations, personnel, and policy conduct. The intended response? Compliance with its operations, recruitment bonuses, morale boosting, budgetary increases, and keeping the U.S. as a whole looking good on the world stage while deflecting criticisms of when U.S. foreign policy goes wrong or causes harm. So in that regard, these military Hollywood co-productions are forms of propaganda. But these films express a different kind of propaganda than we tend to associate with history's fascist and authoritarian propaganda regimes, whether they be the Nazis or the Soviets. The military Hollywood war film product is, after all, not the result of a state commanding the industry, nor is it the result of dictatorial script control processes. Rather, the U.S. military incentivizes Hollywood to work with it on war films, and Hollywood elites aggressively court U.S. military assistance. The result is neither state propaganda nor a purely commercial war film. Rather, the outcome is a hybrid of military propaganda and commercial entertainment, what Robin Anderson and Roger Stahl aptly describe as militainment. But these films are propaganda no less and they are far less obvious to citizens potentially manipulated by them. In that regard, they are more likely effective as propaganda because they're not packaged as such, but instead as just commercial entertainment. When we go to the movies or watch them on Netflix, we don't assume that we are being propagandized. We take this as kid stuff, as leisure fun. I hope you'll be better positioned to see through this commercial camouflage and bring your critical thinking skills to the politics and perhaps propagandistic messages of these otherwise entertaining, globally popular and profitable war films. Thank you very much. I look forward to our discussion session and question and answer period.